Hi, Salem and I are here talking about Daniel chapter 5 today. And Salem, what have you learned so far about the book of Daniel? I have learned that Daniel told King Nebuchadnezzar what his dream meant. Good. And he told them that he would eat vegetables instead of the king's food. Nice. And God has protected Daniel all the way through. Uh, through the first four chapters that we've looked at. Now today in Daniel chapter 5, what's happened is King Nebuchadnezzar has died and his son, Belshazzar, is now the new king. Now Belshazzar watched well, everything that happened to his dad. So all the stuff we learned last week about Daniel interpreting the dream and how King Nebuchadnezzar uh, became like an animal out in the field. You remember that from last week? Well, now what we're seeing is Belshazzar has taken over as king and he has basically forgotten everything that has happened to his dad. And he has forgotten how important it is to worship God. And he's now started worshiping other gods. Matter of fact, he has thrown this big festival, this big feast, and has decided to celebrate in front of thousands of people and his wives and girlfriends and everybody's drinking and partying. He decides he's going to go take the special vessels, the sacred items from the temple, from Jerusalem that they had taken, He's going to take those special sacred items and he's going to use them to drink out of. So he's taken all of the cups and the golden candlestick and all the precious sacred items that God had used, they'd used to worship God in the temple. Now he's using them as his party cups. So they're drinking wine and he has them hold up all of these beautiful uh, items from the temple. He's holding them up and he's saying, we worship the God of gold and we worship the God of silver and we are grateful that they have been the ones who blessed them. Well, God was not happy with that. God isn't happy when we mix things that are holy and unholy. We mix good things with evil things. And so suddenly, when in the middle of their parting, this big finger comes out, and it starts writing on the wall. Belshazzar freaks out. He doesn't know what to do. The Bible says he is troubled. He calls in all these wise men to help him figure it out, and nobody can tell him what it means, this mysterious writing that's on the wall. So finally, his mother, who was uh, King Nebuchadnezzar's wife, comes in, and she says, you have forgotten that there is someone here in our kingdom who can interpret these. He's a holy man. He's a man who the Spirit of God lives in him. And he is the one who interpreted your father's dreams, and he's the one who can tell us what it means, that handwriting on the wall. And so she says, you need to call in Daniel. So Belshazzar calls Daniel in, and he says, You've been, I've been told that you're the guy who can tell us what these mean, so would you please explain to us what this means? Well, Daniel starts telling him about everything that happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. He's reminding Belshazzar about how King Nebuchadnezzar forgot about God how King Nebuchadnezzar became prideful and arrogant, and how God reduced him to being like an animal on the field and then raised him back up to be king, and how God is doing the same thing with Belshazzar. Belshazzar forgot about God. He took holy things, holy vessels, and he's used them for unholy things. He started worshiping other gods. He's become prideful. And this handwriting on the wall is really God's writing, and he's, what he's saying is, I'm going to take the kingdom away from you because... You have forgotten me. And Belshazzar is still very scared, very worried. And he honors Daniel. He gives him a golden chain. He puts a robe around him. He makes him third in, in, in the kingdom, in control. But because of what was written on the wall, the Bible tells us that that very night, another king comes in and they kill Belshazzar and they take over the kingdom. Pretty scary, huh? Well, what does that teach us? The thing it teaches us isn't that we need to be scared about fingers writing on our wall. What it teaches us is we need to be careful that we don't mix holy things with unholy things. Now, I've got two um, vases here. One has water. What does that one have in it? Oil. Oil. Now, do you know what happens if you mix water and oil? Do you think they'll blend together well? You know, sometimes we cook together and we've got to mix things. What do you think will happen when we mix the water and oil? What do you think they'll do? Think they'll mix together well? No. no? Well, let's find out. You take yours, and I'll take mine very carefully. Let's pour them in. There's my water. And there's the oil. What do you see starting to happen? 
What do you see taking place? What's coming all the way to the top? And what's staying down at the bottom? Do they mix? No. They don't go together. They don't blend together. They'll always separate. What happened with Belshazzar is he took God's holy things and he tried to use, mix them with unholy things, false gods and worshiping gold and silver. And it doesn't mix, does it? And that's what made God upset, is he took something that was very sacred, very pure, and he mixed it with something that was not. And what happens in our hearts when we try to mix holy things and unholy things, or good things with evil things, it doesn't mix well. What's something evil or, or bad that maybe we try to do sometimes? Okay, we fight with our brothers and sisters. Is that a holy thing or an unholy thing? Yes, it's a bad thing. Well, does God want us to do that? No, He wants us to show love and care for each other. What happens when we fight with our brothers and sisters and we try to mix that all in our hearts? Does it mix well with what God is telling us? Does it mix well with what He is showing us to do in His Word? No. And what happens in our hearts is we feel divided. We feel bad because we've done that thing. And that's the Holy Spirit coming to help us see that we've mixed, or another good word is compromise. You know what compromise means? It means you've done something you probably shouldn't have. You've let something else in your head or in your thoughts or your actions that you shouldn't have let. And we mixed things that shouldn't have been mixed. And Belshazzar's story in Daniel chapter 5 reminds us that we need to be careful about letting things get mixed. The Bible tells us in Galatians that we are to walk in the Spirit so we won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. That means if we're listening to God and listening to His Word and letting His Holy Spirit work in us, then we won't let the unholy things mix in our hearts. And His Spirit helps us to stay strong and like Daniel, to do the right thing, say the right thing, as we stay focused on Him. So don't mix, don't compromise, and let the Holy Spirit bring holy things into our lives.
Though Belshazzar had watched what had happened during his father's reigns, he didn't learn the lessons. Instead, he worshipped false gods and dishonored the Hebrew god Jehovah. Daniel 5.3 says, Then they brought the golden vessels that were taken out of the temple of the house of God, which was at Jerusalem. And the king and his lords and his wives and his concubines drank from them. And they drank wine and they praised the gods of gold and of silver and of brass and of iron and of wood and of stone. You see, because of King Belshazzar's position of power, he believed that he could behave as he pleased. To desecrate the sacred items used in worship did not even face him. He was the king. To compromise the holy and the unholy not only violated the laws of God, but it was to blaspheme God himself. Belshazzar was not only drunk with wine, but also with power. His God was wealth and prestige. See, he mocked the God of Daniel by not only using the holy vessels to drink from, but also to honor false gods to do so. But when King Belshazzar is suddenly faced with the unknown, everything about it changes. He was so secure and sure of himself, but suddenly he's faced with a greater power and he doesn't know what to do. And too often in our lives we feel so certain about things and then suddenly we're hit with an uncertain situation and we stumble. We don't know where to turn, we don't know where to go, we don't know what to do. We fall off our thrones. Belshazzar did not learn from his father's mistakes. So when Daniel comes before him, he gives him this quick history lesson of what had taken place with Nebuchadnezzar. Verse 20 said, But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened so that he dealt proudly, he was deposed from his kingly throne and they took the glory from him. You see, God gives us so many examples and warnings through his word, his voice, through the testimony of others. But it's up to us to humble ourselves and listen and learn. Verse 22 says, And thou, his son Belshazzar, hast not humbled his heart. Thou hast known all of this. Verse 22 says, But you have lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven, and they brought the vessels of his house before you. And, and your lords and your wives and your concubines, you drunk wine from him, and you praised the gods of silver and gold and brass and iron and wood and stone, those you don't see nor hear nor know. And the God in whose hand your breath is and whose ways he has, you have not glorified. See, God was warning him, Your days are numbered. I've brought it to an end. You've been weighed in the balances and you've been found lacking or wanting. Your kingdom is being divided. What would have happened if God were to weigh our life right now, my life right now? Would he find me lacking? Would there be idols that I had turned to and chosen to worship? You see, in Sunday school, I always pictured an idol, some kind of tiki statue or some golden Buddha idol. You know, we didn't have those things in my house, so I didn't think idols applied to me. But really, an idol is anything that I put above God. Anything that sits on the throne of my heart. It's, actually, I do this all the time. Even though I'm not aware of it, I place my hope in someone or something else. And I put my feelings above my faith. And through the help of the Holy Spirit, we need to help identify what those idols are. And allow the truth and the power of God to work in us to dethrone those idols. And put Jesus in the proper place of our hearts and lives. You see, there are several gods in our lives, idols that we have made, and one of those is the idol of control. We have a desire to be self-disciplined in certain of our lives, and it tends to leave us overworked and isolated. We're overcome with worry and fear that things might slip out of our grasp. We can make others feel condemned and push them out of our lives. Another is the idol of comfort. We desire the easy life, a life of freedom and lack of stress. And it causes us to become selfish and ineffective in helping others. Our search for comfort actually leaves us with great stress. We feel discontent and hurt others by our unwillingness to help them. Another is the idol of power. We desire success and influence. And it can cause anger in us because of the burdens and responsibilities we're placing on ourselves. We feel that we're going to be humiliated or someone's going to show us disrespect that we think we deserved. And it causes us to become manipulative and use other people for our own gain. Another is the idol of approval. We want affection and affirmation. We look for relationships and love anywhere we can find it, and it's really rooted in insecurity. We become codependent and depending on other people and ended up smothering those relationships. You see, we compromise the holy and the unholy. We dishonor God. We may not have sacred artifacts around our house, but there are holy things God has put in our lives, and one of those is time. 
We have only so many days in this world, and those moments can be used wisely or foolishly. Time is precious. Another sacred thing is our resources, our finances, our possessions, our cars, our houses. These are gifts from God, and they can be used for personal pleasure, or we can use them to help and build up other people. We can be open-handed stewards or closed-fisted and controlling. Another gift is relationships. The people in your lives are to be cherished. Your friendships and marriage and children and neighbors and co-workers, they're in your life for a reason. Don't squander the time you have. Invest it. Encourage them. Don't compromise the value of relationships just so you can be in control and manipulate others. Another is our abilities, our work. You may not think of your job as holy, but God has given you a place to be an influencer and affect the lives of people around you. You're going to be an ambassador of joy and peace and spread a message of goodwill, or you can become very self-centered. You can move up the ladder, or you can choose to help the people around you. So what do we do when we have compromised the holy and the unholy? We've mixed the two together. Well, the fastest way to burn off the oil is to light a match. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28 says, Wherefore, we've received a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Let us have grace, whereby we may offer service well pleasing to God with reverence and awe. And then it says, For our God is a consuming fire. We all need to ask God for His truth and grace to come to our lives. We need Him to be the center of everything. We need His love and power flowing through every one of the sacred vessels that we've been given. Let His consuming fire burn up all the idols in our lives so that we can be holy again. We need to know that He's good and that we don't have to seek out selfish satisfaction. We need to see His glory so we don't have to be afraid of rejection, and know His grace so that we don't have to spend precious moments trying to gain power in order to prove ourselves. You see, faith is just trusting in God instead of believing the lies. And to live a life of repentance is simply living in line with what is true about our God. You and I today need to allow the Holy Spirit to search our hearts and see where are the idols in our lives and then allow His grace and His mercy and His power to help dethrone those and place Jesus back in the center. That's where He is to be. He is in the center of our time. He's in the center of our relationships and our resources and our work. In every aspect of our life, we need to place Jesus at the center. He's just not the top of a list. He's at the center of every aspect that you and I have in our lives. I want to pray with you today and ask Jesus to come and search our hearts and help us to live a life of repentance. Looking at Nebuchadnezzar, looking at Belshazzar, their example to us is this. Don't mix holy and unholy things. Don't compromise. But allow the Spirit of the living God to work within us, to live in line with what is true about our God. He is good and He is gracious and He is great and He is glorious. And He's Emmanuel. He is right there with you. Father God, today I'm asking you to search our hearts. We don't want to end up like Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar. We don't need these outlandish and overwhelming warnings. We don't need to be beasts in the fields. We don't need handwriting on the wall. We just need your spirit to come to us and say, you've gotten offline. You've gotten off track. You've, you've put something else where I'm to be. I need you to search us and see where idols of control and comfort and approval and power have overtaken us. And by your power, would you come and dethrone those and we gladly place you back at the center of our lives. God, we want to use wisely our time and our resources and our relationships and our abilities. You've given to us. Those are holy things and we need to treat them in reverence because you alone look at our lives and you do weigh us. It may not be today, it may not be tomorrow, but there will be a time we stand before you and we want you to search our hearts and say to us, well done, good and faithful servant. And it's not been because we did our best, but it's because we allowed the Spirit of the living God to work in our lives. We humbled ourselves before your mighty hand. So we pray, search us today. And would you reveal any idols in our lives and would you show us how we can once again live in a life of repentance, live in the truth of who you are and put you at the center of our lives. We love you today. Let pride and arrogance fall to the side and let us live lives of humility. And as we do, you receive all the glory and the honor. As you do, people are built up around us and strengthened because of the life 
and the love and the power of Jesus Christ that is flowing through us. We adore you today and we bless you for what you're doing in our lives and through our lives. In Jesus' name. Hey, I love you today. God bless you. Have an awesome week. And remember, you are a champion.